good afternoon, everybody. My name is Amory Adrian. I'm the manager of intergovernmental affairs and policy here at the First Nations Public Service Secretariat. Uh, here today to present to you uh, the application process and program guidelines for the First Nations Wellbeing Fund. And uh, keep that one going there. Uh, so we just wanted to, as you can see from the agenda, just to provide some practical information for kind of, you know, uh, the different streams of funding that we have for the well-being fund, the application process, and maybe uh, answering any questions that uh, you guys might have today. Um, so just as an introduction, as I said, I'm the manager here at uh, FNPSS for Intergovernmental Relations and Policy. I come from the community of Shalath, which is in the Statlium territory by way of my grandfather. Uh, but I'm also connected to Ahadasat on Vancouver Island in New Chalmath territory through my grandmother. And I currently work out of my home office here on the traditional unceded territories of the Kwantlen, Keitsi, Matsqui, and Semiamu First Nations here in Fort Langley. Um, maybe I'll just give this a, an opportunity now. We do have a larger group today. So if you wanted to put into the chat a little welcome and where you're joining us from today, that would be awesome. And I also have Mia uh, from my team here with us today. So if anyone's having any technical difficulties or need some tech support in the background, please feel free to uh, just send me a direct message and we'll try to work those out in the background. Um, as you can see from our agenda, we forgot to update the time. So we are starting at noon and not 10. So everybody's not late today. Uh, and then, so we'll go through and do kind of an introduction of the fund and overview of the application process and then open it up to some Q&A. And uh, we'll wrap up the webinar at one o'clock or sooner if we can. And just a couple of quick facts about the First Nations Wellbeing Fund. So it was uh, put in place and developed to support BC First Nations and or tribal councils um, with their efforts to promote well-being and improve quality of life and reduce poverty for their members. Uh, so sorry, seeing that uh, pop up here, move that over. Um, so the, the fund itself, we've got two streams of funding for the well-being fund. So stream one is in relation to community projects, and we provide up to $100,000 now under stream one. And then stream two is for anything related to well-being uh, well planning in your communities, and that's up to $50,000 per project. And uh, eligible recipients are BC First Nations and or tribal councils. And you can apply to both streams of funding. It just isn't, um, you aren't restricted to one or the other. So nations are able to submit to both streams at the same time. And uh, this um, program was developed in, in kind of collaboration with the province of British Columbia. And we do have a grant uh, that has been provided to us through the through the BC government in uh, part of its poverty reduction efforts. And then Mia has posted the links over in the chat for uh, uh, links to our, um, our website for the Wellbeing Fund. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Mia. And so I'll quickly run through the, the program and application guide. This is also on the website, so you're able to download this. Or if you don't have uh, are having issues accessing uh, that website. I'm sure that somebody from FNPSS can send you uh, these via email as well. So as I had mentioned, the uh, Wellbeing Fund was uh, kind of created because we were looking through and we'd identified gaps um, that First Nations kind of are coming up against when they are looking for funding to support uh, well-being projects at the community level. And so we were kind of looking through and finding uh, all of the different programs and services that were currently on offer and uh, through, you know, the federal government, provincial government and other organizations and was kind of, you know, all of these gap areas were identified where, you know, First Nations are doing work when it comes to well-being projects in, in their communities, but there just wasn't uh, a funding source for them to be able to, to apply for funding to support these projects. So um, as I said earlier, we've got two funding streams under this fund. Uh, the maximum under stream one is 100,000. The maximum under stream two is 50,000. And so stream two for wellness planning, um, 
is kind of, you know, as pretty straightforward is to help support you in developing your own wellness uh, programs uh, at the community level. And so we're leaving that open to First Nations to tell us what wellness planning looks like in their communities and to start to, to provide that funding support so that they can develop those plans. And then stream two is the community-based projects. So it can be, as we'll get into below, anything from looking at the renovation of a community kitchen or uh, a shared uh, community space, right up to providing you know, support for regalia making as one of the projects that we supported uh, under our first round. And so, as I said, eligible applicants are BC First Nations, um, are eligible to apply to the program, and tribal councils if they're administering a project on behalf of one or more of their member uh, First Nations as well. And uh, so we're just looking for people who are not eligible to apply are, you know, development corporations, not-for-profit societies, friendship centers, um, that kind of stuff. So you have to be a, a First Nation or a tribal council applying on behalf of a First Nation. And just to also, we'll, we'll highlight this below that um, these projects can't be consultant driven. Consultant fees can be a portion of the eligible costs of the project, but there's definitely some caps that we've put in place. And that's just to ensure that um, any knowledge um, or, or skills building and capacity development is retained at the nation level. And it's not just a consultant coming in doing the work and then and then going away from the community and having none of that knowledge transferred over. Uh, so we'll slide down now to eligible projects. So uh, to qualify for funding in your application, you should you know kind of hit on these, these five bullet points. So describe the extent to which your proposed activities promote well-being uh, within your community. Uh, lay out a clear plan, uh, how this project will have an impact on your community. Um, you know, it can be a new project or program or it can be existing. So if you're working, currently working on a project that's kind of stalled or needs additional support, you can absolutely apply to this program to help that well-being project uh, kind of get reinvigorated and, and keep going. Or it can be a new program or project that you're working on. Um, and then, uh, so through this project as well, through phase three, uh, we realized that we're kind of accept accepting applications really close to the end of the calendar year, and in some cases, the end of the fiscal year as well. But if your project is approved for funding, there'll be up to 22 months or uh, into November of 2025 for um, First Nations or Tribal Councils to take on this work and complete the project. So it's we've wanted to open up that time frame a little further. We know that there's definitely been you, some issues when it comes to you know conflicting priorities or just other you know catastrophic events that are happening in community that really do put you know a, a damper on things when it comes to trying to finish things within a fiscal year. Um, forest fires being a big one over the summer flooding, landslides, that kind of stuff kind of in the spring and, and fall. So we just want to make sure that First Nations have the opportunity to, to complete these projects. And that's why we've extended the time frame to 22 months. Um, if, if your project is approved right away in January of next year. Uh, but yet yeah, project completion will be in November of 2025. Uh, going over to the community projects under stream one, again, you know, up to $100,000 per project. And the intent of this funding is to support First Nations to undertake local projects in your community that help uh, build wellness, reduce poverty, or um, just increase, you know, the overall wellness of your community. So things that we have been focusing on and looking at are local food security initiatives. So you looking at community kitchens. Um, the reason we've raised this fund from our, our initial phase to this round here, uh, originally this was 35,000, we've raised it up to 100,000. Um, just looking at, you know, based on remoteness factors of your communities, you know, it might cost a little bit more to bring in materials or skilled labor to to undertake some of this work. So we want to ensure that that uh, if you're looking at doing a, a community kitchen renovation, that there's ample funding to support that. 
We also know that greenhouses um, or gardens can also be very expensive depending on where you're located in the province. We wanted to ensure that if a community was looking at a greenhouse project, that they had the time frame to work on it, but also some of the funding in place to, to do that as well. Um, this fund also supports anything to do with employment opportunities, training and skills building. And as I had mentioned earlier, a little bit of uh, support around cultural initiatives uh, that will strengthen the community and support decolonization, and just some other initiatives that promote well being at the community or nation level. And that's where we allow the applicant to tell us, you know, what does well being look like at the community level and what types of supports and projects or services do you need to help build well being at the community level as well. Uh, going into stream two for the wellness planning. Uh, so as I said, it's up to $50,000 per project. And the intent of this funding is to undertake wellness planning at the community level, you know, looking at engagement activities to help you develop that plan. So does that mean bringing the community together to, to have community meetings, to have initial kind of discussions around what does wellness mean to our community and then how can we go about planning to start you know bringing you know different types of projects or programs or services in to help support what that looks like um, you know you can also use additional funding so i know that the first nations health authority has a wellness planning program as well and you can use both of those uh, pots of money together to help you know build up and and have a really solid wellness plan for your community going forward. So looking at, you know, end products from this stream could be, you know, just facilitating dialogue with the community or your nation to define what wellness means to them and how you would be measuring, you know, wellness progress going forward. Uh, you know, engaging in dialogue sessions at the community or nation level and developing a wellness plan. And that would be kind of the deliverable that we would be looking for at the end of the project. And similar to stream one, uh, all stream two projects can be worked on until November of 2025. So again, allowing for a longer uh, time frame to help get those projects completed. And I'll quickly just take a pause there and see if there's any questions that have arose just from that initial kind of opening for this. You put it in chat, raise a hand, turn on a camera. Not seeing anything pop up. I'll just kind of keep going. Um, I, I have a question. Oh, yeah, if I absolutely. Can. For sure. I'm just wondering if uh, we're applying under the community project if, uh, say, it isn't, you know, one of the opportunities was to expand an existing pro uh, project. I'm wondering if there's any way, like, if if that would be a portion of it, if we could do two projects, if we feel like um, that both would be eligible and uh, sort of fit within that budget, because one might mean just sort of expanding on or improving on an existing project and the other might be a new project. Um, yeah, or does would, that get confusing? Yeah, for sure, Margaret. I think we would probably take that into consideration and depending on kind of the, the, the applications that come in and based on kind of how much is being requested from us from that fund, I, you know, I think if we were to expend all of that funding, we might have to come back to you and ask, you know, do you have a priority project that we would, you know, have the nation consider as, you know, one over the other? But I think, you know, if you put both of those uh, activities kind of, you know, under the banner, under stream one of improving community well-being, I think we would probably take both of those into consideration and would definitely look at them on a on a case by case basis as they came in. OK, thank you. You're welcome. And, and Thomas, yeah, I'm uh, just about to kind of get into uh, some of those eligible costs. I see your, your comment in the chat about heat pumps and housing plan developments. So I will definitely touch on those. Um, cultural protocols and uh, yeah, Carmen, I think we'll, we'll go through the eligible kind of project costs under stream one, and maybe that will answer your question about cultural protocols in your economic development tourism sector. 
Okay. So under eligible costs for um, the, the First Nations um, Wellbeing Fund, um, hosting workshops, so any community forums. Oh, did I scroll to stream two? Wellness planning, stream one, community projects. Yeah, so the eligible costs do look into both here, Carmen. So I'm just kind of keeping an eye on the on the chat box here. And I, if it doesn't answer it, Carmen, we can definitely come back and, and look at that again. Um, so yeah, eligible costs uh, for you know core project activities. So looking at hosting workshops, community forums, or cultural activities that are directly related to your community um, project under stream one or stream two. Um, support for supplies and materials to support your community projects, public information or communication costs are also eligible. Um, anything related to like course costs, so if you needed to send somebody out for training or some additional kind of capacity bridging or capacity building, that would be supported as well. Uh, we do look at supporting some transportation costs. So if you're bringing community members in from a distance to participate in any of the community forums, uh, some of those activities could be uh, covered as well. Um, if you're bringing in elders or uh, guest speakers for any of your events, you know, the honoraria for participants under those activities is an eligible expenditure. Um, you just need to make sure that you note them in your your project um, your project costing, and then the other two pieces here for staff costing and administration costs. Those are eligible as long as they're incremental towards kind of the the staffing um, costs that you're already paying. So we you can't offset direct salary, but if you have somebody that needs to work a little bit of overtime or this project is currently outside their scope for what they're doing, then you can add staff costs and administration costs to the project application. You just have to to show that it's incremental to their their current workload. Um, other project supports, so this might touch on, on the heat pumps one. So heating appliances, uh, including pellet stoves, wood stoves, or heat pumps are eligible. We just do not provide support for space heaters. Um, if you're looking at doing a community kitchen renovation, um, you know, so the app, uh, fridges, freezers, dishwashers, uh, microwaves, those uh, appliances are supported as well. Um, through through this uh, fund, and then looking at supplies to promote the renovation of existing community spaces. Um, so looking at like if you do have a, a community kitchen or a shared space where you can bring elders and youth together, that needs a bit of you know sprucing up to ensure that that space is utilized, is safe, um, and that kind of stuff. So we do support you know existing the renovations of existing community spaces. And then digital devices for First Nation community members who reside or on or off reserve. Uh, sometimes these are needed. So if your community still might be doing a lot of things through Zoom, uh, we do provide support of up to a maximum of $500 per individual for hardware devices to, to partake in, in some of the work that's being done here. And then uh, any software that's needed uh, to support the project is also supported, but up to, again, $500 per project. Um, some of the consultant costs that I did note earlier. Uh, no, Sarah, there's no, sorry, I'm just watching the, the chat box here. There's no maximum percentage of the budget that can be applied to incremental staff costs. We just need to ensure that it's laid out, but there's no cap on that. The only cap that we do have is on what I'm just about to talk about here is for consultant costs. So for stream one, for the community projects, the consultants costs may not exceed 30% of the total project cost. Um, and again, that's just to ensure that we are any, any capacity bridging, capacity building skills development is retained at the community level and not lost when the consultant, you know, wraps up that project and leaves uh, the community. 
And then for stream two, uh, again, that's up to 60% of the total project costs um, can be put towards consultants. And we do know that for stuff like comprehensive community planning or, you know, helping develop your well-being plan, you might not have that dedicated skill set in the community. So we are increasing that a little bit so that consultants can come in, but working more collaboratively with people in, in the First Nation to, again, ensure that there's definitely a skills transfer, knowledge transfer um, to community members and working kind of hand in hand with that consultant to, to develop those plans. And then uh, just a note here, greater consideration is placed on proposals that focus on capacity building within the First Nation itself. So we do have a scoring and ranking matrix that all applications will be, all applications are scored against so that it's that all has an equal weight at the end of the day. Um, but yes, anything to do with capacity building in the community is gonna receive kind of a bigger score at the end of the day for that one. Um, Ineligible costs for projects. So as we said, regular regular salaries for staff is not eligible. Uh, routine or ongoing operating costs, heating, lighting, security, that kind of stuff is, is not eligible. Um, any software purchases or subscriptions that are not directly related to the projects under Stream 1, not eligible. Travel, uh, unless it's submitted as part of the original budget and approved in the application. So as I noted above, like if you need to bring community members in from a distance who who can't travel like via their own means and you need to maybe like charter a bus like for to bring people in from Prince George to your community or getting out to those more remote areas, as long as it's noted in the application form and approved, it's okay, but we, it's not it can't just come up during the project itself. Um, any corporate or business projects are not eligible as well. And then digital devices not directly related to the project and appliances that are not directly related to the project are not eligible. And then again, there's another piece here on grant maximums for streams one and two. And then... Yeah, again, just to, to highlight that First Nations may submit an application to both streams of funding. It's not one or the other. You can definitely apply to both. Um, application requirements in the review process. So the, the application process, and I'll get to the application forms in a second. We have really tried to streamline the application documents themselves. Uh, but they do need to be completed and submitted to us by December 31st of 2023 to be in the initial round of screening. Um, as long as they're in, that's fantastic. But if we need to do some back and forth with you on your applications, we will make ourselves available um, from, from now until the 22nd of December. If you have questions on your applications, you can reach out to us directly. Um, but after December 31st, if we have additional questions or just need some clarifying um, information from you on your application, we'll reach out and we'll work directly with you to ensure that, you know, we're getting the, the best application that we can from you to ensure that we can move things forward. Um, anyone that has submitted an, an application before the deadline, so we're going to work our hardest to make sure that within 90 days of that application being submitted, you'll have a response from us on the status of your application and any projects that are funded um, will will create a contribution agreement uh, directly with the First Nation. So we'll just have to ensure that we've got the correct people uh, that we can reach out to to have that contribution agreement signed off and returned to us and then we'll set up payment schedules. Um, what we've done in the past is we front loaded all of the um, the funding for the well-being fund, so we'll do a 10% holdback, which will be released once all of the final reporting is done, but we'll make an initial payment of the 90% the of that project up front so that you can take those on. Um, so I'm just seeing the, the scoring matrix, Carmen. I believe we can make that shareable. I will have to check with Amy, my, my program officer, to ensure that it's been updated and 
and that we can share that with everybody. So if anyone wants to see that, I'll just confirm and then we'll get back to you, Carmen. Carmen, if you don't mind just sending me a, a, a direct message with your email address, uh, we'll ensure that we, we capture that and can send that over once it's been cleared to do so. And Thomas, yeah, absolutely. If you wanted to put more information in than what the application form has, we're happy to review that as well. And I think the, the fillable portions of the applications do expand, uh, I think. But if they don't expand to what you need, I'm, I'm happy to, to have an appendices um, or an appendix put onto those for sure. Okay. Perfect. Um, so for the application, so there's there will be the application forms, which I'll go over uh, after I get through this document here. Uh, there will be a, a page on there as well that kind of gives a breakdown of the costs or expenditures for those products, uh, for the project, sorry. Um, and then what we have taken out for this round of funding is in, in the first round, we asked for BCRs for all projects. And right now we just need, we're just asking for a letter of support. Like if it's a First Nation applying directly to the Wellbeing Fund, just a letter of support will be needed. No longer need a, bound, a band council resolution or BCR. But if you're applying on behalf, like if a tribal council is making an application to the program, we're still gonna need BCRs from the member communities uh, just to ensure that um, everybody is on the same page when it comes to these applications coming in. Um, group applications, so each partnering First Nation, uh, if you're if you're going to apply as more than one First Nation on a project, that we will need a, uh, a BCR indicating support for one of the applicants only. The others can just be a letter of support. Um, we only had, I think, one project come in last year that were multiple First Nations working on the same project. So, again, trying to help streamline some of the process. We do understand that some, you know, chief and councils only meet once a month, and it's really hard if you have a lot of stuff on that agenda to get these filled out and, and done in a timely manner. So, working on helping streamline that process a little bit. So the applications are Word documents, so you can submit them as a Word document, or if you wanted to convert them to PDF, that, that's fine as well. And if your budget is in Excel, we'll also accept that. So uh, send those applications over to the info at fnps.ca account, uh, just with the Wellbeing Fund application in the title line, and we'll make sure that we're, all of those are captured. Um, we'll start reviewing all of those applications um, as we're reviewing them as they come in, uh, but we know that a majority of these will probably come over uh, right before the deadline. So we'll start a full blown review of all of the applications in January and uh, funding decisions will be made on a priority basis um, with the following criteria kind of being included. So, you know, demonstrated community need. Uh, we're trying to ensure that we help distribute the funding from this fund to all of the, the nine economic regions that the BCAFN has on their website. So that's kind of how we look at geographic distribution is through those nine, uh, nine regions of the province that the BCAFN has identified. Um, you know, trying to make sure that we've got a balance between urban and rural and also looking at, you know, how these projects are going to have a positive impact for community and, and the members of that community and then uh, how the project or program will build capacity uh, within the First Nation as well. So those are some of the pieces that we look at there when, when we are talking about that scoring matrix. These are, are the pieces that we're really looking at in that matrix. Um, we, so we're talking about now revisions and additional application material. Uh, so absolutely, if you wanted to put an appendix onto your application, we'll, we'll take all of the information for your projects that way. And, you know, throughout the course of a, a program. So if, you're, if your project is approved uh, and you need to make revisions or there's been a, a change in leadership or a new direction has come down from your executive teams that, um, you know, we're able to for sure 
look at you know making those revisions to your applications um so that's not a problem we're very flexible when it comes to the the well-being fund and uh this we need to make sure that you know we're we're flexible when when changes happen on the ground um this note says you know please note that in cases where where revisions are required to an application or an application has been approved in principle only you have 30 days from the date of written notice of the status of your application to make uh, application changes. But we have chatted with some communities because it has come up that, you know, as I said, there's been a change in leadership, there's a new chief and council, there's been a catastrophic weather event, and, and things need to change within that as well. So we're we're also open to, to helping and, and be accommodating as we can when, when things happen at the community level. Um, grant uh, management and application applicant responsibilities. So anyone who is successful through the fund will be responsible for the completion of the project as approved and for meeting any of the reporting requirements that have been laid out within that uh, contribution agreement. And then just, you know, applicants are responsible for the proper fiscal management, including the maintaining of applicable account records for the project. Um, one of the pieces that we do ask for in the final report is to lay out kind of what the budgeted expenditures were, what the actual expenditures were, and if there are any variances um, in that as well. I'm not saying that you need to absolutely 100% adhere to kind of what has been put into your proposed budget because again things shift and change we just need to make sure that you know you're keeping track of where your expenditures are in regards to the the project itself so that's flexible as well but just just to kind of keep in mind that we will be asking for that at the end of the project um you know we'll we'll send out um funding decision letters once the projects have been been approved or denied in some cases you know, not not all projects are you know might receive funding so just you know we will send off uh project approval or denial letters once your project has been uh reviewed and assessed and then changes to approved projects as i said above we can make changes to those we just need to make sure that uh the applicants who submitted that application are writing in a written rationale and just providing what those changes to activities are, or if there's changes in expenditures, what they're going to be as well. And we'll just review those on a case-by-case -case basis as they come in and just ensure that any proposed changes still adhere to the program guidelines for the well-being fund. Um, all activities, uh, so project end dates, so all activities are required to be completed as they were approved in your project. And um, I'm not sure if we can extend the date past November 2025, um, as we only have approval from the province to have projects be worked on um, up until that point. So we're this isn't like a, a fund that gets replenished every year. This is a one-time contribution we've received from the province. So got to ensure that we also meet our reporting requirements to uh, the province of BC. So. I'm not sure if we can extend dates past that, um, but if you have a project that's been approved and you've got project end dates that happen before November of 2025, we can absolutely work with you to work up until that date if you need some project extensions. And then um, we will be doing some outreach kind of over the course of the next couple of years. So we'll host kind of like a lunch and learn webinar or an engagement session. Um, uh, participation in any outreach is voluntary, but we would absolutely love to hear from you to to you know hear if the 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 projects themselves are kind of meeting what you thought they were going to do as you started to to put them online. And it also helps us kind of provide feedback in a feedback loop to the province to hopefully you know push them to continually support the well-being fund going forward. So we would just be looking for some lessons learned, best practices, and uh, anything around like wellness planning in your community is going to be a big one as well. So we just need to have a, a chat about that um, so that we can provide some some feedback to the province as to, you know, why this fund is important, why well-being is important. And, you know, the different types of well-being plans that nations are developing is important as well, because not 
you know, every nation in BC, we've got 204 nations here, and each one is unique in the way that they see wellness in, in their communities. So if we can get a, a really good sense of what those wellness plans look like, what they contain, and how nations see those moving forward, I think that's also an important piece to support our requests to the province to extend the fund and, and just get some additional funding put out into the province for well-being. Um, final reports. Uh, so there'll be a final report template that we will mail out to all of the successful applicants to the program. Um, you know, just, you know, we have to complete the final report form, uh, provide a financial summary. Yeah, thank you for, for being here, Frank. Um, for stream two, uh, an electronic copy of your end product that you've produced would be kind of needed to support that uh, final report. And other things that are optional, but have been really, really, really appreciated have been photos of your project or anything. If you get any media traction in your community, some like links to some media clippings um, have been really good because we've used those to go back to the province of BC as well. So when we wrapped up our first phase of funding, we were able to show different community projects via pictures. And it's it's so much nicer to show a picture versus trying to talk about you know, what happened in the community. So that would be, uh, it's optional, but very, very appreciative if you could send off some photos of your projects. And again, if reports get sent to the same inbox, the info at fnpss.ca, fnps.ca, or if you have to mail them in, if the files are too big, there's our uh, mailing address there. So those that those are the program guidelines and i'll stop there for a couple of more questions before i jump into really quickly these uh application forms themselves perfect yeah the application forms can be downloaded from our website um or we can email them off directly if you're still if you're having trouble finding them on our website uh, judy Send us your send us your email to the the info at fnps.ca and we can send you uh, hard copies of those via email. And me is just reposting them there again. Awesome. I will jump into this really quickly. Just noticing I'm been talking a lot and running out of time. So uh, for the Stream 1 Fund for community projects, this is the application form. Apologies if this is like really small on your screen. I can maybe blow this up a little bit more. So for the Stream 1 community projects, both, both application forms look similar, but have a couple of small different nuances to them. Um, so in, in this part here, we're just asking if you're applying to Stream 1 only or to both streams of funding, so that way we can kind of have both of your applications together. Uh, applicant information, very basic contact. Um, contact information for the person submitting the application. And we just want to ensure that the person who is submitting the application is authorized uh, by your First Nation to do so. And um, so over here is some more additional information if you're applying on behalf of a tribal council. Uh, so there's just some additional information that we would need there uh, around the tribal council applications. And then we get into section three. So it's just project information, brief description of the project, your project title, start dates, end dates, and your proposed budget amount. And then uh, that would be the total kind of request that you're looking for in this 4A portion. It can be one of these kind of pieces that you can check off, or it can be multiple. Uh, it doesn't, it, you're not, you know, you're not really, you don't have to only focus on a few, a food security project. It could be food security along with training and skills building along with health and wellness. So we just, you know, check off the boxes that you feel are appropriate for your project here. And then this is, this part B is optional, but in the Together BC guidelines on the province of BC's website, 
Um, there are other key priority areas that they've identified. So if you wanted to review those, again, it's optional, but you can absolutely add in some additional responses as to how your project also ties into the Together BC uh, program. Uh, proposed activities. So you're just going to outline here, you know, what activities you plan to undertake. And then uh, section five of the program and application guide that we just went over um, has all of the eligible activities for stream one. So you can add those in here. Over to uh, part six is the intended outcomes and impacts. So you can just kind of come into this spot here. You can hit enter and then uh, type in just kind of the response of how this project will help promote community well-being and you can just kind of build those out as you go along. And I think this part here, uh, Thomas, is where, you know, if we just keep adding more, more space, it should expand those text boxes uh, for you there. Um, perfect. And then your proposed deliverables for the program here is just where you'll type your response. So, you know, if your um, project here is to do uh, the renovation of a community kitchen. So your, your response will be a renovated community kitchen that will allow, you know, elder youth and community to come together to, you know, look at, you know, culture and language revitalization. Or if you're doing a, a renovation that's going to support a, a shared community space to help build regalia, that kind of stuff. You, all of that stuff could be typed out in here and that would be that portion. And then um, sustainability. So any projects that are intended to be ongoing after this grant money has been used. And if you're seeking alternative sources of funding, uh, we're just looking for a response here in that, that portion as well. So that would be, um, again, the example I'll go back to here is the renovation of your community kitchen. So once that renovation has happened, it, you know, we just want to ensure that the the proper O and M is in place to ensure that that space can continually to to continuously be used going forward outside of uh, the project that we're working on here. Um, so, part nine evaluation, just looking at describing the measures of success for your project. So, what specific performance measures or benchmarks are you going to use to to, to divine your outcomes. Who is gonna be responsible for that evaluation at the community level and how are you gonna use this information within your community going forward? And then there's a little grant application checklist at the bottom. So, you know, the this form needs to be completed. The detailed project budget would need to be completed. Uh, any, um, no, so. Don't worry about the BCR portion in here. Uh, we'll have to get that part cleaned up. Um, so just a letter of support from uh, some from your office on official letterhead and signed by an individual at the First Nation who has delegated signing authority for the project. And I'm sorry, yeah, we left BCR in because sometimes the letter of support um, with delegated signing authority might not be applicable. So in that case, we would default back to a BCR. If you don't have someone at the community level who can is a delegated signing authority on behalf of the nation. If that's not available, then you would have to default back to BCR. Sorry, that's why we did leave that in there. And if you're applying on behalf of a tribal council, then each uh, First Nation that is within that application would need to also provide a, a BCR to the project. Um, section five, submission of the applications would just be emailed to us here at info at fnps.ca. Again, well-being fund in the application, or if your application form is too big, then you can also mail that in to us as well. And then uh, on the last page, it's just the authorization. So name of authorized signatory, um, title, email, phone number, and date. And that is the application form itself. And then there is the project budget template on the last page here. That just needs to be filled out. And as I said, you know, what's in the proposed budget, um, what's being requested from the well-being fund is the grant, the grant amount requested. And if you have other sources of funds to support this project as well, just slide them in here. 
I know that if you're looking to do like a food security project, I think there's three or four different funds uh, being administered right now. Um, the well-being funded FNPSS is one of those funds. You could also have a funding amount in here from New Relationship Trust, because I know that they have some food security uh, funding available. And uh, the United Way uh, is also launching a uh, food security program as well. So you can just add those all up in here just so that we've got a good idea of you know, the, the scope and size of your project and to ensure that, you know, you've got all of the sources of funds identified to ensure that you're uh, completing the project to the, the best of your abilities. So that's uh, that one there. That's for the stream one funding. I'll again, take a little, a quick pause to see if there's any questions from anyone on the call. not seeing anything go up, so nothing in the chat. And then um, this is the application form for stream two of the, the well-being fund. So again, the first one is just let us know if you're applying to just this stream or to the other, to stream one as well. Again, same applicant information up front, same information for tribal councils in section two. Um, Section three is, is essentially the same for the project information. So just the, the information you're sharing here is just gonna be different in that it's planning versus uh, a physical project in there, but it also does link to the same pieces that we've noted in section four of stream one. Uh, and again, with the identified portions of the Together BC uh, program online, so that would all be similar there. Proposed activities are going to be kind of you know, the same kind of response just to a planning project versus a, a physical on the ground project. And then all of the intended outcomes and impacts are, are going to be the same again, and you can just go down and hit enter. I'm hitting delete here to get rid of B, but you can expand all of that as needed um, to kind of build out all of the uh, points A through D here, yeah. uh, intended outcomes, how does it promote community well-being, how does it build capacity, and how will this reduce poverty at the community level. And then going down again, seven, eight, nine are all the same as well when it comes to deliverable, sustainability, and evaluation. Um, I don't think sustainability won't have the same weight to this application as the stream one applicants do, but if uh, you've got questions around any of these, feel free to, to reach out to myself or to Amy Every. We'll maybe share Amy's email address to Mia so that people can send stuff off to Amy. And then um, again, the, the grant application checklist is the same. We need to have a completed application form, completed budget, uh, either your BCR, if your letter of support is unavailable um, to support the project, and then the same kind of piece if you're applying on behalf of a tribal council. Applications go to the same inbox with the same well-being fund application in the header. And again, if your applications are too big to put in an email, they can be sent to us via mail, a hard copy mail. And then we'll just to ensure that at the office that they're date stamped and then scanned and uploaded to our systems once we receive them. Here's the authorization form. Um, so it again needs to be signed by somebody who's authorized to do so at, uh, at your community. Awesome. Thank you, Judy, for coming in. Appreciate it. And um, send them off to us like, along with the proposed budget. So. I'll stop sharing there because that's the end of those application forms. And I'll quickly just open it up to the floor to see if there are any questions, comments, or concerns. I know we covered a lot of, of information over the past 50 minutes. So I'll just open it up to the floor now. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands raised or anything coming through in the chat. So I will, I guess I'll just stop it there and I'll just uh, leave on a final note of saying again, if you have any questions or need some support with your applications to the First Nations Wellbeing Fund, 
we are available until December 22nd to um, provide any feedback, guidance, or advice to those applications. Uh, we do close the office on December 22nd for the holidays. And um, so we won't be back in the office, I think, until the 5th of January, which is when we'll start to really go in to review all of those applications for the fund. And um, if we do have any uh, ourselves, if we have questions, comments, or concerns after reviewing your application, we will also do some outreach to you directly if we need clarification on anything there. So 